So, I want to welcome everybody. And I want to give you fair warning before we pray, because we're going to pray on this as well. Sorry if the uh, video is not so good for those on Zoom. Um, I'm trying to get this as best as I can. For those on Facebook, um, if I'm not attacked by bees, um, I'm actually outside because I'm trying to maintain the very best um, internet connection that I can because I'm out in the sticks, also known as King George, Virginia. And um, if I lose service and I see it, I'll jump back on. That's the best I can do. And I appreciate everybody. Uh, but let's get to it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the developments we're seeing regarding this pandemic, uh, that th things are opening because people are getting um, healthier. Uh, the numbers are going down. We thank you for that, Lord. Uh, continue to pour out your blessing on, on all who are working toward this. And, Lord, I pray that you uh, not let us go too soon. Uh, and too quickly uh, into uh, any decisions uh, that, that, that could uh, cause problems. We, we just pray your blessing, your wisdom uh, to prevail in these situations, Lord, uh, that indeed uh, all, all would, would be well. And, and Father, we thank you for that. Bless our time together tonight as we discuss this very important issue, Lord, this issue of emotionally healthy spirituality. And for this, we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, let's get rolling. Good to see everybody. I saw Mike jumped in, uh, Jim Morrow, Marina. Uh, good to have you guys. Uh, Brand Danielle on there, Lisa, uh, Pastor Dave. Good to see you guys on Zoom. Uh, Pastor Phil, Helen, Lindsay, uh, Pastor Crystal, others. Uh, so good to be with you all. Even if the screen is somewhat dark. And um, I am uh, probably uh, blessing you by having a more dark screen than normal. Uh, it's been a long day of work, so um, I'm probably not in the uh, best uh, preaching attire, as it were. But then again, Jesus wore the same uh, clothes that he wore all day throughout the week. He wore the same ones to church, so I guess we're good. All right. This week, as we as we wrapped up last week, um, we made the point that discipleship requires putting off the sinful patterns of our family origin. Uh, it requires us to relearn how we do life God's way and in God's family. Now, as I've said every week, and I will reiterate it this week, I'm not going to give you the golden key that's going to unlock all of the answers. But if you look at it like a major combination lock, um, we're getting one number at a time, and that thing's getting looser and looser. So tonight, as, as we talked about last week, you have to go backwards in order to go forwards whenever you're talking about emotionally healthy spirituality uh, to address whatever that problem is that has caused the bad root. Uh, the bad root is then calling, causing bad fruit in your family and in your lives. And so that's what we want to look at. We want to break free from the destructive sinful patterns of our past to live the lives of love and development that God intends. Now, tonight, um, I'm really going to spend most of this time giving you a bit of a homework assignment. Last week, we talked about some very key scriptures to pray and we talked about meditating on those words and asking God to show a, a good reflection of who we really are. Uh, we're going to do very much the same this week, but uh, we're going to look at um, our role as an individual, and we're going to look at our role as a family member and, and consider how this plays in, because the reality is, while wounds from the past may be causing the problems that you're trying to overcome today, you have to understand how your family dynamic works and how you work as an individual and why you work that way 
in order to address it. So I can understand that there's a specific problem with an automobile, but if I don't understand the inner workings of a combustible engine, I'm not going to understand how to fix it, how it should operate when I'm done, etc. So uh, I don't think this is fair because when the praise team gets together, uh, they get surrounded by birds that sing with them praises to God. I'm getting surrounded by bees. I'm not sure if I should take that prophetically or what. But anyway, um, here's what I want to do. Let's start off by talking about you as an individual and roles that become very common for you as a family member within a family structure, but individual roles that result in the way that you behave within a family because this is going to speak significantly on the problems that you're dealing with and why you're dealing with them and why you react the way you react. Um, and some of it might hit a little close to home, but that's the point is to find out uh, what's going on. So ultimately what you'll find, as we have said, behavior is, is largely developed uh, when you get in uh, a family structure and in those uh, formative years, the upbringing, etc. As a result of this, you can see the impact of that behavioral model in the role that you begin to play in a family. Everyone that enters into any kind of family structure, and this is true also of work structures and everything, but a family structure is far more close, far more open uh, than you will in any other, uh, with the exception of uh, sometimes a military unit might experience this, but even then, uh, you're gonna see how some behaviors uh, will, will affect differently. The, the issue of roles is basically a response to the way your family operates and the way you learn to deal with the issues that are being raised. So for example, let's talk about some roles. Um, roles providing clear expectations of how various members within the family are to act in various situations. Um, I'm sorry if, he's, if I'm freezing on you guys. Uh, as I said, the um, internet connection's bad, but I'm, I'm just gonna keep going on as best I can. Um, the, the, the roles that show us how we are to act in a family, uh, one good example is the family hero. If you think about your own family, and maybe you are that family hero, but every family has a hero, and that person is always expected to excel. And the reality is that expectation can be remarkably detrimental uh, because um, you know I love my movie analogies um, don't watch the unrated version make sure that you you watch the edited version but if you've ever seen the classic 80s movie The Breakfast Club uh, Emilio Estevez plays a um, wrestler uh, who is struggling to please his father and to get that scholarship and to win every championship. He is a family hero type and he has no opportunity to fail. Uh, that becomes incredible pressure and that's something that we bring in uh, into our adult lives because then we feel that anytime we fail, we have let everybody down. We, so we cannot accept failure. If we mess up at anything, we're trying to fix something and it breaks. Uh, it can be a cataclysmic situation. Perhaps you know somebody like that. Perhaps you are that person. Uh, that's, that's very common. Family heroes are not the only role that we play. You will also see scapegoats. Scapegoats are expected to make mistakes, to be wrong, to be perpetually in trouble. These bees are gonna be perpetually in trouble. Um, scapegoats are not expected to have talents. They're not expected to have 
key abilities. Uh, they're expected to fail. They, nobody really holds them in high esteem. And so what ends up happening is they actually hide the gifts they possess. Because as long as they are in that role of failure, they're in a familiar role. But when they do excel, many times because of a family dynamic, they will be told, oh, well, you got lucky on that one. Or, whoo, if only you could do that all the time. And that hurts them more than the failure that they're used to and, and the, the comments. So um, they basically set themselves up to fail. And that's, that's a very common uh, dynamic. Um, I hope it is a, a, that connection is a little better. I'm still showing the same bars. We'll keep going. Um, and if at any time you have a question on any of these or a comment on, yeah, hey, I really struggle with this, or um, feel free to chime in there. But um, another family role that individuals play, mascots. These are the family comedians. Um, what you're going to find, what we're going to talk about, is that unhealthy families don't like to express feelings. Mascots use humor to avoid feelings. Much like the class clown that is usually embarrassed or just trying to get attention, the mascot, it becomes a role where they're trying to divert their attention. They're trying to divert the pain. They're trying to take their mind off of things. So everything becomes a joke. Uh, they get people to smile or laugh. But in doing so, they're burying their feelings. And that becomes very problematic. Um, there's another role called lost children. They learn to bury their feelings very quickly. They learn how to become numb because no one is listening. That's what a lost child is. One who feels neglected, one who feels like um, another movie scenario. If you ever watched The Incredibles, the first one, the you know the young girl, she got one by the way. Um, the young girl, um, she feels invisible, like no one even knows she exists. Uh, that's what a lost child is. Um, later in life, they will grow up and become the strong, silent type uh, because they take on that persona of um, be very quiet you know let no one know that you're there because they're afraid that if someone does see them there a lot of times for a lost child um, not only do they feel ignored but when they make their presence known it is unwelcomed this happens a lot um, and and I'm not saying it happens all the time but many times in broken homes when you get two families together uh, sometimes in parental scenarios where you have um, a, a step parent or a, a parent who is maybe not even a step parent, this can be a common scenario. Uh, that that is the lost child. Uh, another role is uh, the doer. Uh, this is the person in the family who's, who can get things done, and basically they serve in a martyr role. Uh, their doing remains constant. They're always doing stuff to please people uh, because that's where, but they, the doer, what makes the doer different from um, a hero, as an example, is that the doer is always getting things done, but with the added element of perpetual complaining. Uh, the doer is a workaholic because they feel like that's what's needed in order to overcome their own deficiencies. But it doesn't satisfy them. This goes back to that swoop model we talked about, self-worth equal to others' opinions and personal performance. This person, when you see this, especially in childhood, the doer, the workaholic, always trying to do perfect on all these things, but always complaining about it, that is always, well, I shouldn't say always, nothing is always. That is almost always a key indication that they have significant self-worth issues. And they're doing all of this stuff to boost their self-worth, and it's not working. They don't feel better about themselves. And, and this is why 
Uh, you'll see people who are overachievers and you wonder why they're so depressed because they're lacking the self-esteem. Something has taken their self-esteem. Uh, another role that, that you have to look at, the enabler. The enabler tolerates inappropriate behavior and does nothing to confront it uh, because they like to give the impression that their family is normal. Their struggle is the idea that they're not normal, that there is a problem. So they paint the facade. They, they put on the false mask, the false front of the perfect little family and the, and the perfect children and the perfect person. Um, in the Christian community, enablers may seem like saints uh, because they look very patient and, well, you know, we're just going to, you know, trust God with them and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and the issue is, I'm all about trusting God and things, that, but when there's unchristian behavior or destructive behavior in a family, it has to be addressed or else it's going to continue to make bad fruit and, and maybe poison the whole tree. The enabler doesn't want to do that because they don't want to confront people. Because they, they can't handle the fact that something's wrong. They just want everything to be right. So while the hero is expected to achieve and accomplish, um, you have the doer who is marked more by the complaining because they're not finding self-worth in it. Uh, but even in that same group, you'll have what's called the little prince or the little princess. Uh, this is the one that's always expected to look good in the family. This is the picture-perfect child uh, in, in, in all they're accomplishing. Um, but they will... Uh, I'm getting to that, Danielle. Yes, great question. Can we be more than one role, she's asking. Um, but with the, the little princess and the little prince, they're always expected to look good. Uh, to play the part, you know, dress up in their Sunday best, always have the fun things to say, always serving all the other people and doing all the good stuff. Um, but this, this is a learned behavior, and it is played out at great sacrifice to emotional well-being. They find out that other people in the family affirm them greater when they act this way. So really... What they're doing is they're sacrificing their own identity to be shaped in the identity that someone else. So this happens a lot of times in sports. This happens in pageantry uh, and things in any number of things in, in uh, concert, choir and things of that nature where people where parents are living vicariously through their children. And the problem is, is the child never develops their own stable identity as a result of this. Um, let me give you one more. The saint. Uh, the role of the saint in the family is the one who is expected to be perfect in every religious way. Uh, I know growing up, our family, it was, a, it was a cousin, he had the role of saint. He was going to be the man of God. And uh, you honored him and, uh, you know, if you had any troubles, he, you called him for prayer. And that was his role. And, you know, that can be problematic sometimes because... In a family structure, the role of the saint means you don't have the opportunity to slip, to have a problem. Another movie analogy. Man, I'm rolling tonight. Um, it's kind of dating me a little bit. I already gave an 80s movie. Let me give a, 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 a 70s movie. If you've ever seen Staying Alive uh, with John Travolta, the disco one. Uh, I'm sure you all remember that great white jumpsuit that he wore, polyester most likely. Uh, but if you remember the movie well, um, when he's not combing his hair or dancing, uh, Tony, the main character, is uh, trying to encourage his brother, who is a priest. And he doesn't want to be in the priesthood anymore. He just wants to go live a normal life. And his mom is just berating him because she feels... It is so um, unheard of for him to do this to the family. He is, after all, the priest. And, oh, I missed that one. He's going to be mad. Um, this is the role of the saint. And, and, and if at any time they're not doing exactly what is expected of them, dude, 
we're going to have to have a talk here because you're about to get smacked. Um, that that saint is, is going to have a really troublesome life when, when trying to deal with things. So, okay, I've given you a number of roles, and, and you might say, okay, what is the point? Which one are you? Or which combination, as Danielle asked? This is going to be important because if you go to counseling, if you go to talk to someone, to pray with someone, and you say, you know, I'm really struggling with something that happened to me years ago. I, I, I burst out in anger, or I'm struggling with this particular addiction, or I can't overcome this, for, this unforgiveness, or I've got this bitterness, whatever the problem is. Well, how you get through that is going to be determined largely on the role that you have played for most of your life because your role is very indicative of the way you view yourself. You have adopted a role in which you are comfortable. And frankly, none of the roles that I said there in and of themselves are healthy. They have healthy attributes, but they have very unhealthy tendencies. So you first and foremost must approach it. It's much like um, when we were talking uh, the other day with Lindsay, Pastor Crystal and I, uh, we were talking about uh, the, the issues with um, learning types and, and uh, management skills and um, the strength finder assessment, et cetera. Um, well, when you look at that, that's letting you know what your tendencies are, what your skill sets are. You're going to have to know that because your role is going to determine how you're going to proceed in your uh, spirituality. In most families, more than one person can play the same role. Uh, so there may be more than one mascot. Um, sometimes they'll kind of battle for roles, uh, which can be a little problematic. Most often one of them will play one role or more, but they'll have a dominant role, and another one will play a different role, and they'll both be jealous of the role the other one is playing because they think that the other one is getting all of the attention, all of the affection, all of the affirmation uh, because they see the response to their role, but the converse is true of the other one. So it, it, it causes problems. And as Danielle noted, you can have more than one role. Typically, you'll have a dominant, uh, but people can also switch back and forth between roles. In my example, um, there were times that I was around certain people and, and I had to play the hero because I was, I was uh, counted on to uh, take care of something. Most often, I was the doer because I was trying to get affirmation but was not getting it, so I was complaining about everyone and everything in my family uh, because it wasn't satisfying. But when I got around senior people in my family, uh, my beloved grandmother, as an example, I became the mascot because I did not want to display a problem in the family. So I hid it with humor, and it's a very sarcastic humor. And some of you know that very well. My wife is probably going, mm-hmm. <coughs> because many times if people don't know me very well and they see me in my genuine mascot role when I'm cracking jokes with people, they think, wow, man, he, he, does he not like me? And it's not that. I was raised to be the mascot with a very sarcastic, cutting humor to take the edge off things, and I had to be better than the others. And I've developed that, and that's my tendency. So now I have to realize, number one, that I have that tendency that can be offensive, and number two, why am I turning to that? Now, I'll joke with people because I like to be a jokester and things of that nature, but, but I'm talking about when I get uneasy. A lot of times when somebody, when somebody is doing something that's pushing my buttons, I will throw out a sarcastic joke that's got a point on it. And I see my wife smiling right now. Uh, and that is my way of saying, you're about to cross the line. You need, and so you see, I'm trying to shape their behavior because that's how I was raised. That's the role that I played. That is the sword that I draw 
when I'm when I'm when somebody's confronting me with something that I'm uncomfortable with instead of having a reasonable discussion. Now you might say, well, anytime we've had problems, we've had a reasonable discussion. You just come to us. Yeah, that took a long time for me to learn that. Instead of just making a cutting remark and walking away and saying, you guys better recognize. Does that make sense to everybody? How those roles will play. Or I'm just going to be happy and, and, and be the little princess or the, the little prince and, and make everybody happy. And then you go home and you drown yourself in a martini or, or Prince Valium or, or whatever the case is. Nobody's answering me. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, do, do you guys understand at least a concept? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, sir. Okay, I got two on Zoom and nobody on Facebook Live. So um, if you guys don't understand what I'm talking about with roles, let me know now because I'm going to talk about how this plays into family dynamics and how it, it plays into your structure uh, and, and your healing. All right. Pastor, can I say something about some of the um, roles as well? Please do. Um. Not to add any roles, but a lot of times the roles come to make us feel safe, just like the whole defense mechanisms. But we talk a lot about the outline or the um, outside effects of the roles and what they kind of seem like as far as the scapegoat and the mascot and things of that nature of what they do. But the underlying, the things that people don't see is that they're usually to cover up fear and anxiety, hurt, and some sort. So as we're going through this emotional, healthy spirituality, those are the things that we're trying to bring out. And as Pastor stated, yeah, the, the, the roles in and of themselves may not be healthy, but you can use them in a healthy way. So a lot of mascots, for example, if they use it in a healthy way, they can become comedians or different things like that. You know, the hero can become very successful. But like Pastor was saying, it's something that we, we have to work on. It's something that we have to address and understand and know that we do. Thank you, Reverend Tanya. That, that is exactly what we need. Um, Danielle, if you want to uh, have them written down, um, uh, I'm happy to provide you that list uh, that I have here so you can take a look at them. Uh, and then a as you look at them, the importance is exactly what Reverend Tanya just, just shared with us. The, the reason we need to recognize our role, and especially our dominant role, uh, even if it's dominant in a setting or a situation, is this. The whole point of the role is to bury your feelings. Because no matter how much we want to d deny it, the reality is most of us, and I mean the overwhelming majority of us, come from dysfunctional, unhealthy families. Because that's just the society. That's just the way it is in this contemporary era. So, one of the main functions of the unhealthy family is to keep feelings buried. You know why? Because we're trying to live the American dream. And we're trying to show everybody that we're keeping up with the Joneses and everything is good. And if everything is not good, it makes us feel like we are not right. Well, here's the reality. We're not right. We're broken by sin. And sin has adversely affected everything within us. But in our tendency, going back to those who were in our book study of total truth, our tendency, our desire is to be the arbiter of truth, to determine what is good and what is bad for ourselves and not let God be in that position. Well, when you take God out of the equation and you're going to be manifest destiny on the personal spiritual level or emotional level, then when sin comes into the equation, you don't have an answer for it because you've removed God from the equation. So you have to tell yourself that you're okay because your, your mind can't deal with the fact that you're not okay. That the problem, I mean, how many times, and I don't need to raise a hands or, or comments on this, but just think about this. Maybe you don't now, but in your past life, how many times whenever something went wrong, how fast were you to point out how everyone else contributed to that going wrong? We all do it. Because it's in our nature to not see the wrong in ourselves. We judge others by their actions. We judge ourselves by our intention. 
families are no different. Is there a negotiator role, Angela? Uh, Angie Thomas asked. Yes, there absolutely is a role where uh, you're a peacemaker, or I'm sorry, a peacekeeper. Uh, the biblical peacemaker is not synonymous with a peacekeeper. But that's someone who is trying to keep everybody happy. And, um, you know, was it Mark Twain that said uh, you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all of the time? Uh, the peacekeeper negotiator, that's where their life will never be satisfied because they're always going to fall short. And guess who they blame? The peacekeeper and the negotiator always blames themselves. Well, I could have done more. What if I would have allowed that? What if I would have said this? And the reality is you're not the one who did it. They are. And we're not dealing with these things healthy. Pastor Dave asked, can the, can the roles affect us in our relationship and walk with God as father and in the way we interact with him? Great question. Yes, because of uh, what we have with displacement, we, we cast onto God. We talked about... Um, I think it was in, our, in this group, I don't know, it may have been in one of my classes, um, in the movie The Shack, how the main character, <laughs> um, when he encounters uh, God, God first, God the Father first comes to him as an African American woman to say, I am not who you think I am. We take our roles and we look at our father figure and we put that on God. <laughs> but here's the kicker. Oh boy, I didn't mean to get into a theology class, but this is so good. Um, great theologian named Karl Barth of the 20th century. Uh, I talked about him Sunday uh, saying that you can't dissect the Word of God. The Word of God is not dead. You're the one who's dead. The Word of God is dissecting you. That guy. Um, his main argument in his entirety of theology, he wrote six million words in a series called Church Dogmatics. And his main argument was this, stop making God in your image. Because the role that you play, you think God plays. Because that's your nature. But what we fail to see is that our sin nature is not his nature. We are not in the true image of God in which we were created. We have taken on the sin nature. So when we get transformed and we're being reformed into the image of God, we have this tendency of going back to the old image. And then because that's the image, we think everybody else is that way or thinks that way to a degree. And we start projecting it on God. Well, God knows my heart. If you've ever heard someone say that, or you've ever said that, that's very much in line with well, God and I are one. We're, we're, we're the same. And the reality is we're not. Don't make God into your image. That's what Aaron did during the Exodus. When they made the golden calf. They made a golden calf and he said, Behold, here is Jehovah who has delivered you. God had invited them on the mountaintop. He said, Look, you can be in my presence, but you've got to consecrate yourself. They didn't want to consecrate themselves. So what did they do? They made God into their image, into what they wanted God to be. We do that with our roles. So hopefully you're seeing that we approach God from the perspective of our role. And the reason is, is we think God as Father, as a parental figure, is going to deal with us in that same role the way our family, <laughs> our family structure did. And as a result, we're approaching him from a sinful starting point. A sin nature starting point, I should say. Um, Reverend Tanya says, Hero, Lo oh, thank you for putting them out there. Yes. Um, excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, so, because one of the main functions of unhealthy families is to keep feelings buried, families work out this unique to every family but dysfunctional way to work together to keep feelings buried. And you have, like I said, with the sarcastic jabs, you have a way within each family and every role has a way to say, um, 
we're crossing the you're you're crossing my line this is my bounty kind of a lion's roar kind of thing but at the same time it's a way of saying stop right here or else feelings are coming out and and we're going to have to address this stuff and they don't want to do that the number one thing that happens since the mid 20th century in western civilization is this um in order to keep feelings buried, families in their dysfunction have increasingly turned to addiction. This is an ongoing burial because the main function of addiction is to escape or to numb feelings. Think about the prevalence, not just of alcoholism, though that is true, drug addiction, though that is true, food addiction, porn addiction, sex addiction, um, aspects of greed fall into the addictive behaviors. Addiction is off the chart. That's why the United States is the most overweight country in the world and we take the most medicines of any country in the world to deal with our depressions. And people say, well, you know, why don't you just deal with life? Because they can't. They haven't been trained to. They haven't learned that in their families. They haven't learned that in their schools. And all they know is that they are a failure. And it's destroying them. So you know what most medications do? They numb you to that issue. Now, I'm not talking about people who have a legitimate um, disorder <laughs> in which... You have a chemical imbalance or something like that. You got to get that straightened out. I'm talking about people who don't know how to cope because they were never taught. Here's another example of that. We call them snowflakes because they melt so easily. You look at this current generation. How many kids, if you disagree with them, they don't know how to handle it. And they'll start screaming in your face. And I'm talking about kids in their 19, 20, 21 year old, you know, young adults. I'm not talking about five-year-olds, though that happens as well. I'm talking about young adults. And they just start screaming because they, or, or they start crying or they start breaking stuff in riots because they don't know how to contend with opposition, another point of view, somebody pointing out that they're wrong. Um, it's, it's problematic. So um, Lindsay says, talking about feelings makes people uncomfortable very uncomfortable I don't want to talk about my I I have to I learned I had to trust someone before I would talk to them about my feelings that helped me a lot as a counselor to know that we, we have to build trust before we can and we're going to talk about all that uh, later on but uh, this I'm, I'll tell you right now I'll guarantee you some of you have ants in your pants right now because you don't want to talk about your feelings you just want me to hand you, instead of a pill that makes everything better, the spiritual prayer that makes everything better. But we got to uproot that stuff. Carolyn Terman asks, how do we respond to a family member who is constantly negatively sarcastic when it is brought to their attention, they just laugh? That is a great question, Carolyn. Um, and um, we're going to unpack that as this discussion goes on in coming weeks. <coughs> you... you you have to come to a point of having a healthy family. And I'm going to list some of the criteria on different family status uh, here in a moment. But you, you have to come to a place where um, you have discussion. And really, when you're at that point, typically, you're in need of counseling. You have to have a counselor sitting there uh, that is saying, hey, do you hear what they're saying? And, and, I, and, and I'm not saying that in an ugly way. But chances are, the fact that they respond negatively sarcastic and they just laugh would indicate to me, I'm not giving this as a diagnosis, but I would automatically be looking this way. And any of our Christian counselors who are on with us right now are welcome to uh, jump in and, and tell me if, if I'm missing the mark. But it sounds like that person was probably raised in a mascot role where the way they dealt with contention in the family was through humor to kind of laugh it off to bury it 
And so when they see that there is a failure in the family for which they could be responsible or at least have a role to play, if not contributing to it, then to fixing it, and they might be nervous about that, uh, they don't want to run the risk of failure. They don't want to see where they have done wrong. So their solution is to joke about it, to make everybody happy, and then it kind of goes away. And so in this situation, if you go to them and you say, well, don't you know this, 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 all you're doing is hitting the nail in deeper because the, <coughs> the, the problem that you're bringing them is, hey, this is hurting me. But when you present it to them in that way, if they're not dealing with their role and their behavior, the only thing they know to do when they have failed is to keep doing the thing that is causing you the heartache, if that makes sense, because we're creatures of habit. So they're trying to protect themselves and probably want to protect you as well and, and mean it, but start joking about it. So when they're joking about it, that might not be them saying, I don't care. It may be them saying, I can't handle this and I don't know what to do here. And they need help. They're going to need help because there's some deep-seated... If, if someone you love that dearly is coming and you're having that kind of an engagement, that's a deep root. And, and, and it's something that's going to be a problem. So uh, thank you, Reverend Tanya. She said you were right on. Um, and uh, uh, Lindsay, uh, another Christian counselor, said it's hard to hear. You have a problem, so we laugh it away. So uh, there you are. And then um, Pastor Crystal, none of us want to hear that we have a problem or that we are a problem. Defense mechanisms kick in where the trust factor comes in. Exactly. Um, that, that's exactly it. So, so when you see that, um, the answer is whenever somebody, whenever somebody reacts in a way like that, what you're really seeing is the bad fruit. That's what's leaving a bad taste in your mouth. And it's probably causing stuff to unravel in you. But what I would submit to you is there's a bad root that's causing that reaction. And they need help to get to that. Um, so, Pastor Dave asked, do you think it could be that that is what they learned from a parent because they learned that from their parents? Absolutely. It is very generational. And um, it, 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 you'll see grandparents treat grandkids that way. Um, and many times because, look, we're not talking about families that are ready to, you know, we're not talking Amityville horror families that are ready to, you know, pull out an axe on each other, Lizzie Borden type stuff. You, you love your family, and that's what makes this so difficult because the reality is Christians don't like to talk or think critically about their families. We're taught to honor our mother and fathers, and we love them. And I'm not saying your family saying my family was wrong what i'm saying is we we initiated this from a sinful nature born misrelated to god and moving away from him and so we are handling everything in a very worldly and destructive way and the the answer to that is to bury it what did they want to do with the body of christ bury it what does our sin nature want to do with godliness? Bury it. What does godliness say? I am light. Reveal everything, I'll heal it. What does darkness say? Bury it. And that's what our nature does. It buries it. The, as I said a moment ago, one of the key ways that we see this is addiction. Um, Tracy notes, our problem can be the emotion of entitlement. Um, that is with, without question, you know, we come into the point on any one of those roles where we say, I have done my part. Now I deserve this and you may very well, but also what entitlement usually comes to in the context of unhealthy emotional spirituality is that I can do illicit, illegal, unbiblical, unholy um, behaviors because I, I deserve it. 
Now, it falls also into the realm of addiction. I've, ha I've done a great job today. I'm going to reward myself with a pizza. I've had a really bad day. I deserve a pizza. Or, you know, a joint. Or a pill. Or whatever. Um, it, it all falls in into this situation. And uh, when we look at this, those addictions which birth the entitlement attitude they can be substance they can also be behavioral addictions in families are basically stress management that's what they are they're stress management strategies family members feel uncomfortable as we talked about the unspoken family rule overrides any discomfort they don't want to confront it. They want to keep things running smoothly. They don't want the world outside to know our problems. Uh, so we bury it. And if somebody doesn't want to bury it, Mark Laser uh, coined the phrase mind rape, which is a very in-your-face title, uh, but a mind rape when you say way grow up um, in his estimation the content of the message may be correct your 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 feelings about this might be off the mark or you need to mature a little but the way it is presented in a family structure the timing is inappropriate the delivery is inappropriate and the goal is not to help them mature by pointing out where there is a deficiency, but to get them to stop feeling so that you no longer have to confront the deficiency that you probably caused or contributed to or are responsible to fix. So in that scenario, the, the mind rape is one where it's trying to keep everybody quiet because I don't want to deal with it. Because I can't deal with it. I'm, I'm, I haven't, I'm not equipped. I'm not emotionally mature enough to deal with it. Um, or I'm too selfish, which is another maturity issue. Um, and so the answer, instead of laughing it off, it is to shut them down. So that you don't have to deal with it. Debbie asked, do our roles depend on the place we are in the number of children, like the oldest, middle, or youngest? Um, many times it does. Because um, there is... Uh, a tendency for parents as they mature to treat subsequent children way um, you know the commercial where no, they won't let anyone touch their first baby by the time they have a second baby they're handing it to a stranger <coughs> while they're loading groceries in their car um, so it, it definitely can Debbie um, it's not a guarantee uh, but typically um, you'll have some nurture issues with the last child. Um, you'll have some more strict disciplinarian with the first. Um, but even then, you know, I could play the role of a mascot, but somebody else who is a firstborn may have been a mascot in their family. Um, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm the youngest in my family. Um, so it's not a guarantee. Um, it, 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 has to do more with the relationship so um, when I'm trying to get the the affection the affirmation the favor of a particular and I see that that is their trait I will likely follow that trait so it's more of a semblance uh, scenario uh, if that if that helps your uh, if that answers your question um, Lindsay says when you excuse away their feelings you lose trust and th absolutely that's the peacekeeper uh, and, and, and that's why the peacekeepers struggle <laughs> because they're never going to keep the peace and they're going to lose the trust of people because they're going to say well you let so and so or even themselves well you know you didn't hold me accountable so where, where am I going as a Christian as a parent as a counselor you've got to hold them accountable otherwise they're going to walk all over you because they're going to go back to what's normal for them and what feels comfortable for them so um, the 
the tendency is to either bury, often through um, addiction, numb it, or uh, through mind rape, shutting it down. Uh, this occurs when someone does not listen to or accept the validity of someone else's feelings. When they're just shutting it down. That is the indication, a key indication, that you've got a bad root and, and they need help. But here's what I, I, I implore you to hear. I know it's frustrating and I know it breaks your heart and I know it puts you at the end of your rope and you feel like they're on your last nerve. But realize the same frustration you're feeling, they're probably feeling. Or they have grown so numb to it, they don't even know who they are anymore in that regard. The fact that they're shutting you down is because they don't know how to cope. And that is indicative that they have a problem. Let me make a biblical statement. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. They don't know. They, they were raised in a broken home, a broken environment. I shouldn't say broken home. A broken nature, a dysfunctional nature, individual and family. And they're just responding. It's no different than, you know, if you get a, a feral cat, and bring it into the house you can try to domesticate it all you want but that thing's gonna bite you eventually because that's its nature that's what it knows and so we have to we have to come at it from that approach um, in his research of 1,000 sex addicts Pat Carnes found that 97% were emotionally abused they, they were forced into these various roles and were not allowed to express their feelings um, in a way that was, look, I may not agree that the way you feel is correct or adequate or mature, but I want to know why you feel this way and what I can do to help you develop from that. 97% did not have that. So they had to bury, either through rolls, through mine rape, whatever the case. 74% were physically abused. 81% were sexually abused. So when the question was asked, do we get it from uh, our parents and our grandparents? Absolutely. The behaviors that we see from them, we project onto others. Because we're taught that is normal. And here's what you'll find in, in studies of, and I'm not advocating, obviously, but the vast majority of, of uh, physical abusers of children in an aggressive manner and sexual abusers of children, they do it because they were abused that way and they feel like that is normal. And what ends up happening is they don't say, contrary to what you might see on all of the cop TV shows, they don't say, well, I'm an adult, now it's my turn. They become an adult, and they think something is desperately wrong with them because of the way they were wronged. So in order to ease that pain, they project that pain on others to feel a sense of normalcy. What happened to me was normal, there's nothing wrong with me. Now, that's not only true on the sex, that's true across the board on emotional, you know, if you're talked down, <laughs> if you're berated, uh, if you are very, if you come from a, a family <laughs> where one role is very dominant over the other, male over female, female over male, that's what your inclination is going to be. Why? Because you think that's normal. That's what we have to contend with. The converse side of this is a healthy family. Healthy families are structured by healthy rules, righteous rules, biblical rules, positive prescriptions, not negative prohibitions, not mind rape, not burying. There are no scapegoats in a healthy family because everyone is required to take responsibility for his or her own behavior. 
this is foreign to most people. And you know it. You know it because you pointed out to er about everybody else that they don't have integrity. They're not re taking responsibility for what they did. But the reality is we're so prone to point this out to others, we fail to realize we're not taking responsibility for ourselves and our own actions. We're excusing our actions. Or we're, if we're not excusing, we're at least saying, well, okay, I know I did this, but this is why I did it. This person, that's not allowed. You know, where we're going, that's not allowed. You got to have accountability. You got to recognize what your roles are to know how you are going to respond to things and say, I'm not going to respond to things that way. I'm going to take responsibility for me. And you know what that means? I can't take responsibility for anyone else. This is one of the hardest lessons I ever had to learn in life. I can try to do the best I can to help people out, but in the end, it's on them. And that's really tough for the negotiator peacekeeper. It's very tough. But we got to come to a place where we don't blame others. And no one gets lost. The lost child. Remember the lost child? Their, their feelings, they were just kind of brushed away. Uh, it was like they weren't even there. They didn't matter. There has to be a cognitive effort to engage. To have discussion. How are you doing? Okay, now how are you really doing? Here's a great question. Let's say you're in a situation where um, your child um, has got news that grandma or grandpa has passed away. Or the family pet has died. Or you got a new job and you got to move. Here's a great question to ask those kids. How does this make you feel? What are you going through? Not just what questions do you have, where are we going to live, and, you know, do all dogs go to heaven? They do. Um, how you that's, that, that's how you eliminate the lost child. That's what a healthy family has to do. Members don't isolate themselves. They seek help from one another. They learn to trust one another and lean on one another. I have no problem saying that my wife and I have learned to do this uh, because of me. And, and I've had to come to her and, and she now knows that there are times when I come to her and I say, I am not handling this very well right now. I need your prayer. I need a little bit of time to think this thing through. And she'll be like, well, where are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, and then there's <laughs> other times where she'll come and be like, um, man, you're really rolling. It looks like you're handling this everything good. And I'm like, everything's good, you know. God's blessing, and but we have to have that discussion so that we're there for each other uh, on that support system. We have to be open. And we have to be accountable. Experiencing a full range of emotion is not to be discouraged. Um, Reverend Tanya says, oh, wait a minute. Um, hurt people hurt people. Lindsay said so true uh, <laughs> and healed people should bring healing to others that's our goal um, Reverend Tanya says <coughs> how are you feeling and let them know whatever it is it is okay we have to learn to teach them emotions yes the full rate let me tell you something uh, Pastor Dave's on here with us tonight and he might uh, have have had similar things. I remember when I was in ministerial training, and I know we're right at time. Um, when I was in ministerial training, I was told that when you go to a funeral and you're conducting a funeral, you need to be solid as a rock for those families. And I had many ministers in this class that were saying this. You got to be the rock. You got to be the source of stability. You know, they don't need to see you breaking down and this and that and the other. Well, some of you have been with me at funerals. And you know, man, my heart breaks for you, and I'll cry. And I'm not going to withhold my emotions. You know why? Because we're in this together, and I'm going to be real with you. You don't need me to be a rock. You need me to be real. 
and to tell you, I'm brokenhearted with you, but I also rejoice with you because this is only temporary, and we're going to be reunited one day, and it's going to be a glorious day. But it's okay for us to show these emotions. See, you see how we bring our roles even into our jobs, and we, and, and we portray those roles at the workplace, and we need not do that. Um, Angie says, it is difficult to engage with others who don't want to engage, understand, and form a healthy relationship. Oh, it's, it's near impossible. Um, I, I'm going to hit you with some knowledge here that might, but people will not change until the pain of changing is less than the pain of staying the same. They don't want to confront this. None of us did. I mean, there's a whole lot of things within each and every one of us that we did not want to address until the pain of staying the same outweighed the pain of change. That's what it's got to come to. And, and that's a difficult thing. Uh, Shanice says, I was in counseling as a teen and was given the book of the four. I use those with my kids to make sure they can understand their emotions, take responsibility for the reactions, and work out a better way to handle it. Great. That's good stuff. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll have you join in uh, and, and talk a little bit more about that uh, when we do Healthy Families next week. Um, I like to sit them down and to be open about what they see from me when angry or upset. And it's very eye-opening to know that they pick up on it and they register it as normal. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that, Shanice, because they see that as normal. And that and I'm sure that you're like, oh, um, my son once told me I cry when I don't get my way because you get angry and you don't want to get yours. And that hit me so hard. There you go. You said it yourself. Um, yes. But I'll guarantee you you're going to break that tendency with your kids as you work that out. They're not going to follow that behavioral pattern. And that's really what we're, we're looking at. Okay, let me let me hit these real quick. Um, Pastor Phil has one on here. Uh, <coughs> wait a minute. Um, Lindsay says, it's also important to learn the intensity of feelings to determine at what level those emotions are. Absolutely. Very good point. Because sometimes it's part of the role play. And it's a facade to bury, to de de deflect. But then sometimes it is that, like I said, with that sarcastic thing I would throw out, it is our way of saying, um, you're about to hear me roar, and this is, or I'm going to isolate and go into my cave for the next three weeks. Um, let's see. Phil, <coughs> Pastor Phil, I'm sorry for calling. The enemy attacks our healing process because not only will we be healed, but we can help bring healing to others. Yes. So, the, so important that we face these things in our lives so we can honor God with our lives. Yes. Being reformed in the image of God, it is in, in, instantaneous on the spiritual side. That lifelong process is the emotional one. But as we're reformed in his image, we can help others find that same deliverance. Um, Pastor Crystal says uh, to Angie, that's why the Bible says, live at peace with everyone as much as you can. Great point. Um, man, every week she brings in a great scripture. Um, some people will not expect, uh, accept peace. The Bible does say that. L Paul said it. Live at peace as much as you can. Uh, the Holy Spirit's got to convict them. Their, their situation has to uh, hit them. And uh, yes, and Tanya responded to that very well as well. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Think on your roles. Who you are, what your role is, what your typical reaction is, because we're going to build on that. Next week, I'm going to talk about um, the, the levels of healthy to, well, actually, I'm going to start with unhealthy and go to healthy family structures. And we're going to talk about, um, so in those roles, if you're like, yeah, I can kind of see I was this, and I can see why they were that, and I can see that my, my sister was this way or my cousin was this way. And, and now that I'm processing that and I see, yeah, that's how I respond to most things in life. And okay, now I'm starting to see that. Um, we'll elaborate on um, why you do that. 
um, what it is you're probably trying to bury. Uh, but the first thing we have to do is talk about family structure because the family structure that developed that role is now a family structure that you control within your immediate family and you will probably replicate that same family structure be it good or bad so we're going to talk about the different family structures and we're going to talk about what a healthy family should look like and some goals to set uh, for that um, as we go forward much like hey how do you feel uh, let's have this discussion etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, can't wait for next week I just saw so uh, I can't either. If there's anything in the meantime, let me know. But we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you some tips. I'm going to give you like four or five tips that you could start right now that I guarantee uh, will have. you'll see a phenomenal increase in the healthy uh, relational aspects of your family within a month. That will change everything. But I'll also tell you this. Uh, some of them you're going to say, Oh, man, that's so out of my comfort zone. But that's the point. So, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you, God, for keeping the Wi-Fi on throughout. And I look forward to seeing everybody, um, prayerfully Sunday. Uh, but if you're in your own spot, then uh, we'll see you on uh, next Wednesday. And for those watching online that this is shared with, may God bless you in any way that we can help you at Greater Discipleship Center please let us know. Be blessed. Look forward to seeing you guys then. Thank you, God. No be.